Many of us are afraid. There is so much uncertainty in the world and it's rising. During the 2019 pandemic, global uncertainty reached unprecedented levels. The World Uncertainty Index, which measures global and political uncertainty across 143 countries, reached an all-time high at the beginning of 2020. And all of this is frightening. We've been afraid of catching the virus. We've been afraid of what's happening at home, afraid of the workplace changes. And now we're even afraid of going back to work. A recent return to work survey in the US showed that 73% of Americans are worried about going back to work for fear of COVID problems. And all of this uncertainty is due to change. Our world is constantly changing. And that's just about the only thing that we can be certain of. Whether it's change in demographics, in the environment, in technology, it's changing and it's scary. And all of this fear is completely natural. You see, we are hardwired to fear change. And that is what's helped us to survive for so long. Our reptilian brain is over 500 years old and it's the oldest and it's the most powerful part of our brain. It primes us to react. Our pulse quickens, our muscles tense before we even know if there's danger. It's why we jump when we hear a noise in the bushes before realizing that it's just the neighbor's cat. And the reptilian brain cannot distinguish between major or minor threats. Have you ever felt that a looming job interview is like an impending storm? Or maybe somebody's made an unpleasant comment to you and it's felt like a full blown attack. And then there's the newer part of our brain, the neocortex, which is responsible for the rational part, the thinking part of our brain. And you might think that the neocortex, when the reptilian brain sends us all this fear, that it might, tell, it might tell the reptilian brain to take a hike. But it's not that easy. The reptilian brain is really persistent. It primes, it pokes, it prods us to go into fight, flight or freeze, even when there may not be danger at all. I'm a trainer and a coach in resilience, and I work with many leaders across many different organizations. And what I see is a common set of fears linked to the basic need to survive. Fear of failure, fear of rejection, fear of not being good enough. And all of these fears are exacerbated during change. And here's what I tell my clients. It's not the fear itself that's a problem. It's how you deal with it. You see, many of us see fear as a negative emotion. We don't like the unpleasant feelings that it provokes. We don't like that ball in our stomach or that knot in our throats. We just don't like it. And you could imagine that the rational brain could reason be logical and diminish those fears. But it can't because the rational brain doesn't like those feelings. It judges fear. No thanks, it says. We don't want those unpleasant emotions. What we need to do is we need to move towards fear. We need to feel it as it's expressed in our bodies without rationalizing and without judgment. One of my clients, let's call him Bob for today. He is a successful professional. He is a hardworking guy who has high standards of himself and high standards of others. He is a hyper achiever who strives for recognition and reward. 
And what most people don't see is that underneath that tough exterior is a man who doubts his own abilities and who is often consumed with episodes of anxiety. And COVID-19 has been a test for him. At the beginning of the pandemic, he was in charge of a team of 30 people. And like most managers, suddenly he was having to manage them remotely and to engage and to motivate them whilst they themselves had their own COVID concerns. And to compound to his difficulties was the fact that there was a real risk of redundancies in his team and a pregnant wife who was in the high risk category for COVID. And all of this time, Bob had been doing so well, but things were changing and the cracks were starting to show. Bob was missing deadlines and starting to make mistakes. He was getting into conflicts with his colleagues. He was withdrawing in team meetings. His sleep was affected and so was his health. And when I started to work with Bob, he was close to a burnout and on sick leave. Now, Bob was the kind of man who didn't like to dwell on emotions. For him, talking about emotions was really hard and talking about fear was even harder. For him, showing your fear was a sign of weakness. You just had to get on with the job. That's what he would say to me. And as we started to work together, what we saw was that his emotional outbursts and his cognitive difficulties and his ill health were all linked to a pattern of suppressing fears and ignoring emotions. What he had to do was to move towards his fear. Bob had to start treating fear like his friend and stop treating it like his enemy. He had to invite fear down from the basement where most of us leave fear and have fear come up to the dining room table for a chat. If you think of your emotions like messages in your inbox, and I know that for many of you, your inboxes are probably quite scary places, but the messages, it's up to you whether or not you open that email. It's up to you whether you click on the email and you see what it has to say. If you don't click on the email, you can be certain that you will get a reminder and then another and then another until you can't help but pay attention. So what should you do when you click on that message? Well, you can't file it, you can't delete it and you can't forward it to somebody else. Instead, you should sit with that message, sit with the fear, look at it, feel it in your body. Because feeling it in your body is the first and most fundamental step to working with your emotions. And why not say what you're feeling? I'm afraid. I am feeling worried. Research shows that labelling your emotions significantly reduces their impact. In 2012, at the research department of UCLA in the US, a group of researchers carried out an experiment on a fear of spiders. A group of people were asked to go outside and there they were exposed to a large box. And in the box was a spider, a tarantula. And they were asked to walk towards the box and if they could, to reach inside and touch the spider. And then they were brought back inside again. And then they were divided into four groups. The first group was asked to say how they had felt. For example, I am frightened of that big hairy tarantula. The second group was asked to downplay their fears, to reassure themselves and perhaps say something like, that spider is in a box. It can't hurt me. I don't need to be afraid. The third group was asked to say something completely irrelevant, like it's a nice day today. 
And the fourth group were not asked to say anything at all. Then the participants were re-exposed outside to the spider in the container. And once again, they were asked to walk and to get as far as they could and if possible to reach in and touch that tarantula. So what were the results? Well, the first group who had been asked to label their fears far outperformed all the other groups. Their palms were much less sweaty and that's a very good measure of fear. And they got much closer to the tarantula simply because they had named their fears. And so now back to Bob. Well, Bob isn't facing a hairy tarantula, although we are all facing spiders of a sort. His spiders are more his fear of failure and his fear of not being good enough. And as we've been working together, Bob has started to address the fears. He started to look at them, to talk about them with his friends and his colleagues and to journal them as well. And today, Bob is working with his fears rather than being controlled by his fears. And so what about you? What are you frightened of? Are you frightened of COVID? Are you frightened of going back to work? Are you frightened for a loved one today? Whatever it is, sit with that fear. Look at that fear. Talk about that fear with your friends and journal about that fear. Because that fear has a message for you and you really should listen.